Greetings to each of you, whether it's morning, the middle of the day, or early evening in your part of the world. A very warm welcome to our guests and attendees joining us globally. My name is Ibrahim Ati, and I have the honor of moderating today's panel, proudly hosted by the Young ITA. Our central theme today revolves around the energy transitions in the MINE region. This discussion has guests of excellence that I cannot wait to introduce to our audience. Professor Abdul Wahib will shortly deliver the keynote address, offering invaluable insights into the evolving dynamics within the MINE region. Before we have the privilege of learning from his expertise, please allow me to briefly remind you with this profile of excellence. Professor Dr. Mohamed Abdul Wahib stands as one of the most respected figures of authority in the international and Arab arbitration circles. With his extensive scholarship, mentorship, and exceptional service as both counsel and arbitrator, his significant contributions include representing the Republic of Egypt at UNCITRAL, and we extend our heartfelt congratulations on his, on his forthcoming presidency at the CIARB in 2025. Congratulations again, Professor Abdul Wahib. As Dean of the Africa Arbitration Academy and the visionary founder of Zulfiqar and Partners in Cairo, his expertise and very profound understanding of international arbitration, especially within the Middle Eastern and African landscapes, set very high standards in the field. We eagerly anticipate the privilege of his keynote address, assured of the profound insights he will share. Please, Dr. Abdul Wahib, we are all awaiting your keynote. Thank you very much, Ibrahim. Uh, it's a pleasure to join you. Um, and it's an honor to appear before you today. Uh, I'm sure that the panelists you have, you have a great panel. I will just set the stage in a few minutes with uh, my two cents, I would say, but I'm sure you'll benefit much more from the insightful contributions of my esteemed co-panelists on this panel. So I would like to focus in the uh, next few minutes on some of the causes and trends of energy disputes, and then move to uh, from the trends to actually energy transition towards renewables, and share with you a few thoughts on that, which I think are important. Uh, by and large, so far what we've seen in the region in relation to the causes of energy disputes range from failure to complete design of energy plants or involvement of any construction in that sense to effectively having fast track projects that aren't handled promptly in a way uh, mobilization and cash flow issues also feature among those disputes. Um, and I'm looking at oil and gas renewables, and I'm adding as well mining sector, which is not strictly energy per se, but it is indeed an important feature of the MENA region. But I think one important aspect that has caused disputes as well is the relative bureaucracy in terms of licensing processes and revocation of licenses, poor management of contracts, regional conflicts and sanctions, and by the way, regional conflicts that do not necessarily mean conflicts happening in our region, but happening in other parts of the world and having an impact on our region, especially when it comes to energy. And of course, we've witnessed a surge in energy disputes as well, following the so-called Arab Spring uh, and a regime change. The reason being, of course, is that these are capital intensive projects at the intersection of many disciplines, including construction, project finance, and others. And if you look specifically at the uh, 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 charts in terms of uh, causes of energy disputes, specifically when we're talking about fossil fuels arbitrations, we will find that the Middle East and North Africa account for about 10 to 12% of these disputes worldwide. Of course, Latin and South America um, dominating in that sense, then followed by Asia Pacific, Europe, Africa, and then the Middle East, and then after that, Latin America. Um, what are, we see as trends as well is that the China sort of Belt and Road Initiative has led to a number of projects globally and impacting the MENA region more importantly. For example, China's National Offshore Oil signed an agreement with the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, ADNOC, uh, 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 in 2019 and, and, and afterwards as well, to provide some cooperation and activities in relation to oil and gas. And then we have also Saudi Aramco uh, has been increasing its refinery capacity uh, from 4.9 billion barrels per day to 10 billion barrels per day by 2030. So that production of um, energy from fossil fuels as well is ongoing. Uh, now, of course, in terms of ADNOC, which is the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, as I mentioned, 
They uh, manage approximately 95% of the UAE's proven oil reserves and 92% of the gas reserves. Qatar Energy is another major player in the region, and it manages, of course, uh, the upstream, midstream, and downstream oil and gas operations. Um, now, the interesting thing is the transition from fossil fuels uh, to renewables. And here is the issue, of course, as many of you, but I think the numbers are important. Um, water, for example, uh, which accounts for 2.5% of the total volume of the world's water, we're actually living on a fraction of that because 70% of that 2.5% uh, is actually in the form of ice and permanent snow. And we're talking only about fresh water. So we're actually living off uh, about 200,000 cubic kilometers of fresh water only on our planet, which then has led the Food and Agriculture Organization, the FAO of the United Nations, to predict that by 2025, around 1.8 billion people will be living in countries or regions with absolute water scarcity. Oil, which is uh, a major player in terms of fossil fuels, we can say that we only have reserves of about 45 years remaining of the oil reserves. Natural gas, around 55 years remaining. And phosphorus, which I think is the most important one because it relates to an element that without which plants cannot grow, we have 50 to 100 years unless new reserves of that specific element are found, which is very important part of the climate change agenda is to generate phosphorus in that sense, because without it, plants cannot grow. Uh, of course, coal has more abundance, but it has an impact on the environment. We have about 180 years uh, of global production of coal for the countries that continue to use that. But apart from this, this has led to a movement of decarbonization, looking at renewable options. And this is for the MENA region is becoming increasingly important. And one important aspect of that is the solar power. For example, in Qatar, there is the Al Kharasa solar panel uh, project, which is Qatar's first large scale solar power plant, uh, 80 kilometers west of Doha. And that project is expected to generate almost 2 million megawatts during its first year of operation. Uh, and Qatar Energy, of course, has awarded a further contract to uh, uh, Korean companies in that sense to develop and construct two solar photovoltaic plants with a combined capacity of 875 megawatts. So it is becoming a big business in that sense. Jordan as well is focusing on renewables again. And by 2030, Jordan is expecting to generate 50% of its electricity from renewable sources through the development of a smart grid and energy storage projects. In addition to that, Kuwait is also focusing on solar projects and is looking at developing a mega, uh, five gigawatt solar power complex in the north of Kuwait. Uh, Saudi Arabia, a major player, both in terms of fossil fuels and renewables, uh, the Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, um, together with Aqua Power, has signed an agreement to develop a 2.1 gigawatt solar power plant in Mecca. And uh, in addition to that, several other projects are underway as well. Uh, to achieve uh, what Saudi Arabia intends in relation to its national renewables energy program uh, in that sense. Um, in Egypt, we have had also very uh, interesting developments in terms of the Bimban near Aswan, uh, a very large solar power plant. Uh, in addition to that, we have a Komombo plant as well, again, in Upper Egypt, a solar power plant. And we are also considering as well a wind uh, power project to generate power from wind in that sense. The UAE uh, ha is developing its uh, solar park, which is destined to be the world's largest single site solar park in that sense by 2030 with investments totaling more than 50 billion uh, dirhams in that sense. When completed, the UAE will be able to reduce carbon emissions by over 6.5 million tons per year. Uh, so pretty much it is a very active uh, agenda in terms of renewables. And we've seen that Egypt has ho hosted uh, the COP, the Conference of Parties in relation to climate change uh, back in 2022 and the UAE in 2023. So the region is very much becoming a major player in that sense. 
what remains is what that means for us in terms of dispute resolution is that we're going to see new types of disputes arising not only from the traditional fossil fuels types of uh, contracts and dealings, whether concessions, supply agreements, processing or otherwise, we're going to see as well disputes in relation to renewables, both in relation to the construction as well as the management operation, as well as the supply and demand of energy from these renewables projects. And I think it will become more and more interesting and vibrant for the MENA region in that sense, because it is one of those regions that we have abundance in terms of solar power, wind also, and also blessed with some water resources that can generate hydropower. Um, with that, I will leave with you with some thoughts on this. And I'm sure that the panelists uh, would do a, a great job in enlightening us on many other aspects of energy disputes in the region. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Professor Abdelouhe, <clears throat> for this excellent keynote introduction. And you are very happy to meet you in person in Riyadh for Disputes Week, inshallah. We understand that you have to leave now, and we thank you again for having accepted our invitation. Thank you again, Professor Abdelouhe, Sheriff Nabi, Kathir, Kathir, wa Thank you so much. Thank you. Of course. After this piece of excellence and to engage more thoughts, I would like to restart the discussion with a question first to all the dispute practitioners in the room. How many of us are actively exploring the COP28 implications for international arbitration? What do shifts in energy policies, sustainability efforts really mean for the practice? How investment and commercial arbitration differ when renewable energy is present? Today's dialogue will peel back layers and unveil a few surprises along the way. In this compact session, lasting between 50 to 70 minutes, we will delve into the transformative energy landscape of the MENA region at a time of pivot pivotal change, with distinguished practitioners guiding us. Our exploration will uncover the increasing role of the UAE and the wider gulf in pioneering sustainable energy dispute resolutions. As the world looks towards the MENA region for leadership in energy transition within dispute resolution frameworks, we will highlight innovative practices regulatory evolutions, and nuanced art of resolving disputes in an era leaning towards sustainability and green initiatives. For the audience, understanding the complexities of the Middle East is not just educational. It's critical for avoiding costly missteps in legal proceedings on projects within the region, amplified by initiatives such as the Saudi vision. It's also vital for securing successful relations with the clients there. So today, besides strategic insights, will also be providing you with essential keys crafted by regional experts to navigate with confidence disputes as it growingly intersects with the Middle East, one of the major references. Before we proceed with the agenda, allow me as your moderator to share a very brief introduction about myself. My name is Ibrahim Ati. I am a young legal professional trained in civil and common law in the EU and the US. I recently passed the New York bar and I have a strong passion for international arbitration. It's in this dynamic field that I want to play an active role. I'm very happy to officially share that, based on my efforts, the young ITA has exceptionally voted to appoint me two days ago as its co-chair for the entire Middle East region. Thank you so much. During my mandate, through multiple initiatives, I aim to bridge diverse legal cultures and foster a deeper understanding between the West and the East. But today is certainly not about me. It's about the incredible assembly of expertise, intellect, and experience we have on our panel. As we navigate today's dialogue, we aim to achieve two primary objectives, analyze the MINE energy transition for foreign investors and practitioners, and share expert considerations to bear in mind when dealing with energy cases. Now, let's turn the spotlight to our panelists. Let's delve into the discussion, starting with the first panelist, Mrs. Bis. Jessica Bis and Christine, partner at King Spalding, based in New York and London, stands out as a formidable attorney in international arbitration with significant expertise in the energy and construction sectors. Her work spans high-stakes commercial and investor state disputes with a considerable portion of her practice dedicated to the MENA region. Her extensive experience and strategic approach mark her as a pivotal advocate in the International Arbitration Committee, especially in the Middle East. The profound expertise of Mrs. Bees promises to greatly enrich our discussion today. I am delighted to initiate this conversation with you. Mrs. Biss, my first question is the following. The MENA region has historically been considered a powerhouse in favor of conventional energy, 
which means oil, gas, or coal. With transition to renewables, what opportunities are there for foreign investors in the region? Well, first of all, before I dive into the substance, allow me to say thank you very much for the invitation and for the opportunity to participate. I think this panel, first of all, formidable colleagues, and I really think that the topic is critical at this particular time. Um, so in terms of the opportunities for foreign investors, honestly, at this point in time, there is an absolute plethora of opportunities. Uh, it is a critical juncture in the energy transition phase. And you heard an excellent keynote on some of the ongoing opportunities that have already arisen and some of the projects that have already started construction. Um, just adding on perhaps to what the professor was explaining. So current and currently it's forecasted that energy demand is only going to grow. So by 2050, global energy demand is expected to grow an increase by 50%. And so to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, while also increasing energy supply, the world really needs to decarbonize and it needs to do so very rapidly. So this of course means that there is significant demand for energy in a way that we perhaps have never seen before, green energy in particular. Conventional hydrocarbons are expected to provide only about 15 to perhaps 40% of the global energy mix in 2050. And this leaves the rest to be supplied by green energy. And the MENA region here, it has really a unique position. It has the economics and the scale to invest and to develop renewable energy technologies, which could supply a very significant portion of the world's energy by 2050. The MENA region is uniquely suited in several ways. It has, it receives a quarter of the world's solar energy. 75% of the MENA region has access to winds that are strong enough for utility scale wind farms. The MENA region also has ample access to land for renewable energy projects. And solar power production in the MENA region costs one fifth. One fifth, that's a significant decrease compared to other global average. And this is according to a study conducted by the International Renewable Energy Agency. And also, of course, we can't forget that the MENA region has the capacity to store up to 170 billion tons of CO2 for its carbon capture, utilization, and storage. And that's also often called CCUS, as I will refer to it later on, too. Um, this is one of the highest storage capacities in the world. So again, there is a lot happening already in the MENA region. I will not repeat what the professor kindly shared with us in his keynote. I'll just really emphasize here that it is an absolutely opportune time for foreign investors to explore and to invest in the region. And as many of you probably know, and as you've just heard, some of the largest green projects are already underway in MENA. So I think the very brief overview that we received from our keynote today and the little that I was able perhaps to add to it really illustrate the, the immense potential of the region to drive forward and to contribute to the energy transition. But of course, this begs the question, what comes next? What is needed to ensure that this happens and that international investors can work smoothly with their MENA partners. And here I think there are a few policy initiatives that would be very helpful to set some of the groundwork. Um, for starters, I think it will be important to establish common standards and certifications to measure carbon emissions in the MENA region. Um, and we need to support policymakers in establishing financial incentive schemes to promote investments in renewable energy. Now, of course, this has been done in many other countries around the world. I think anyone interested in international arbitration and dispute resolution will probably be familiar with the series of cases that were brought against Spain and Italy and a few other European jurisdictions in relation to certain changes that they made to their incentive regimes. So those are definitely important historical data points for us to take into account to make sure that we don't replicate some of the mistakes that were made there. Um, and of course, it will be very important for us to, to work towards negotiating and facilitating public-private partnerships to attract research and development capabilities in the MENA region. And finally, as a disputes lawyer, of course, this is always at the forefront of my mind, it's critical that we work to mitigate risks through robust dispute resolution mechanisms.
perhaps I'll I'll stop there for now since I'm I I've probably gone on too long already. No, not at all. Thank you so much, Mrs. B. Thank you so much. Um, building on our U.S. perspective, could you please perhaps share with our audience what should U.S. investors and practitioners working on mine related energy disputes be aware of when drafting dispute resolution clauses or thinking about dispute resolution options? I realize it's a technical uh, question and I would be happy for you to answer it. Thank you so much. I, I mean, this is a very critical topic and it's also very complex. So the best I think I can do to answer the question is give some illustrative examples to drive home just how important it is for foreign investors, US investors and others to really study the jurisdictions that they're planning to because there are regional differences within the MENA region that, that will make a huge difference to how you draft your arbitration clauses, what type of dispute resolution you're even allowed to agree to, and what substantive laws can apply to your agreements. So this is a very broad and, and as you mentioned, a technical question. So I'll, I'll do my best to answer it, but I really do want to emphasize it is critical to understand the jurisdictions you're investing in and to do that research and put in the time and the work necessary to make sure that when you draft your dispute resolution clauses, they are actually enforceable because that's the point of having them, being able to use them. Um, so coming back to, to the substance of your question, I think it's it's probably trite to say that consent is the cornerstone of arbitration. And that has become so deeply rooted in many countries, I'd even say in most countries around the world, that there are very few remaining barriers to parties voluntarily agreeing to alternative dispute resolution like arbitration agreements. So, for example, in the United States, private parties are free to agree to arbitration subject only to very, very limited exceptions, such as public policy concerns or issues surrounding the arbitrability of certain kinds of disputes. And even federal agencies, U.S. federal agencies, are permitted to use binding arbitration under the Administrative Dispute Resolution Act of 1996. Now, admittedly, only a few agencies have issued the necessary guidance and the use of arbitration by federal agencies is therefore still pretty rare, um, but it is nevertheless a viable option for the resolution of disputes with uh, that involve government contracts and federal agencies. So there is that option in the US. That is not necessarily the case in all MENA jurisdictions. And again, please, don't rely on my word here. Do the research if you're considering investments, if you're working in a particular jurisdiction. I will just give you a couple of illustrated examples to draw upon this point. So given just the sheer volume of projects that are currently underway in Saudi Arabia, I'll use that as an illustrative jurisdiction here. Um, for contracts between private parties, both courts and court litigation and arbitration are available options and they are indeed frequently used. That is for disputes and arising from contracts between private parties. They can agree to resolve their disputes in Saudi courts or in courts abroad, pursuant to private commercial arbitration, foreign international arbitration. There's a lot of flexibility there. And Saudi Arabia is also a signatory to the New York Convention on the Recognition and Enforcement of Foreign Arbitral Awards of 1958, which makes enforcing arbitral awards much easier as well. That, again, applies to private agreements. In agreements that involve the Saudi government, there are different rules that apply. So the default position is that government entities can only judicial courts resolve their disputes, and that has to be done in Saudi courts. Agreements with Saudi government uh, have to be governed by the laws of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, and all contract documents must be in Arabic. Now, thanks to some recent legislative developments, arbitration is now finally an option. But in order for a government entity to agree to an arbitration clause in a contract, they must first obtain the approval of the Ministry of Finance. So this is the wrinkle that parties must be aware of when you're entering into contracts with the Saudi government. That approval must be obtained or your arbitration clause may very well and indeed likely will not be enforceable. The arbitration agreement with the Saudi government entity must also meet some additional requirements. So the estimated value of the contract must exceed 
a 100 million Saudi rials. So that's approximately 26.5 million US dollars. The governing law of the contract must still be the law of Saudi Arabia, and the arbitration agreement and its terms must be set out in the contract itself. Now, that applies to government entities, but there's also agreements with the Public Investment Fund, which has been driving a lot of investment lately in Saudi, a lot of the giga projects that we're seeing and hearing about, for example, NEOM, um, which is also a green project. So these agreements with the Public Investment Fund are also very important to keep in mind that there are particularities. So contracts with the PIF must be, again, governed by the laws of Saudi Arabia. But... That does not apply if the subject matter of the agreement will be implemented in a foreign jurisdiction and if one of the counterparties to the contract is a foreign person. Now, if those requirements are not met and the contract is subject to the laws of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the parties may agree to arbitration only in accordance with the laws of arbitration issued under Royal Decree number M34. Now, in case where there is a public investment fund agreement that is subject to foreign law, there is actually a hierarchy of preferred foreign laws. Um, at the top is the laws of England and Wales, next comes the law of New York, and then comes the law of Delaware. So that is the, the prescribed order of preference for foreign law in government, in contracts with the PIF. Now, the complexities involved in the Saudi system alone, I think, illustrate the need to, to really research the jurisdictions that you're investing in. There are other jurisdictions in the MENA region that have um, their own peculiarities, and I'll perhaps just briefly mention the UAE, since that's where I happen to be right now. Um, it, there are here differences that regarding the applicable arbitration laws. So the governing law for disputes seated onshore in the UAE is federal law number six, of 2018, the UAE arbitration law, and that only came into force in June 2018. For disputes that are seated in the DIFC, however, those are subject to the DIFC action law. And then ADGM also has its own arbitration law. So you need to really be careful when you're selecting your seat of the arbitration because there are different default arbitration laws that could, could apply to your dispute. Now, the parties are free to select one of those expressly in the contract, but it's still important, as I mentioned, to research these default positions because you want to make sure that whatever you select is enforceable. Um, and I'll leave it at that. And just once again, I think for the third time now, stress just how important it is to research the particular jurisdiction that you're dealing with. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Beast, for those very well articulated and detailed responses, especially on the thresholds. Uh, personally, I personally noticed that the US, the EU, and the MENA disputes are getting more and more connected in the arbitration community. Thank you so much again for your intervention. For your intervention. I would like to present our second panelist now of excellence, Dr. Jalal Al Adab. Dr. Jalal Al Adab, whose expertise in the MENA region is ranked among the best, joins us from Paris, where he leads the dispute resolution practice at Bird and Bird. His decades of cross border practice, combined with his bar qualifications in Beirut, New York, and Paris, and his leadership within the Sea Arb European branch and various prestigious entities, render his arbitration insights exceptionally valuable. Recognized as one of the strongest arbitrators of the Arab world, it's an immense privilege to hear his perspectives on dispute resolution within the Middle East. Saeed Jaddan bi wujudina bain al-hukum al-Arabi ma arqa mumathal di bilad al-Arzu. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Adab. I would like I would like for the audience if you could please offer insights on the environmental aspects in energy disputes. Of course, thank you very much for this very uh, energetic uh, introduction, Brahim, uh, and and thank you um, for having me together with uh, uh, Jess, Jessica, Shirin, uh, Hamad, whom we've just heard, and um, and of course uh, Alia, whom we can't see anymore, and Ines, who have been instrumental in in putting um, uh, pulling up this. Um, uh, this webinar. Uh, thank you again, Brahim, for your initiative. I think it was time we uh, we discussed about uh, those um, energy issues, uh, especially in the Middle East. Now, uh, I I will try to tackle uh, from a MENA angle um, 
this this um, um, overlap between energy disputes and uh, environmental disputes, with perhaps a, a more uh, more weight put on on the uh, environmental uh, side of it. Um, the if uh, I read correctly, your the title, the subject of your um, uh, of this um, webinar, Brahim, navigating dynamics and arbitration in the region and its global sustain sustainability goals. Correct. So when, of course, uh, one discusses uh, the question of global sustain sustainability goal, uh, of course, it is uh, unavoidable that um, you think about the, the Paris Agreement, which, which uh, Jessica just touched upon. And uh, that's, uh, of course, fundamentally about less carbon emi emission. Um, and and you, you have mentioned, I think, a very uh, key idea in your uh, brochure, which is that uh, the uh, role of energy should not uh, boil down to being an asset, but to, to being something else. A little bit like time is not just a, uh, an asset, it, it can be something else. And one uh, uh, when one talks about energy transition, it's obviously about um, a transitionary phase. The question is how much it is to last. And that's uh, that question of time is, is, is key to uh, many disputes and to uh, the value of many um, uh, energy assets. But it's also a question uh, fundamentally of moving from uh, 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 oil and gas to renewable energy. One question, for example, that uh, I'll put to uh, uh, all of you is, what do you include in renewable energy? Or rather, what is not oil and gas? One question that has been very much discussed since uh, the, the rise of the energy prices with the uh, uh, Ukrainian war uh, was whether together with um, uh, wind farms, uh, solar, um, uh, solar, of course, uh, energy, whether you would uh, also include nuclear powers and uh, power plants. And uh, I think it's, it's a question that is, is worth uh, uh, asking. Now, all those questions are not new. Uh, if you think about the last point, which I will not uh, cover, the nuclear, nu nuclear plants disputes, you have this huge uh, Areva versus Finland, uh, dispute that has been that that lasted more than ten years for more than ten years, uh, and that started uh, quite some time ago. Solar plants, uh, and um, and more specifically, uh, well, no, those are two different things. Wind wind farms. I, I remember my very first experience in drafting uh, uh, very challenging arbitration agreements in the field of uh, wind farms uh, because I started my career in uh, project finance. And that was more than 20 years ago. Uh, and some uh, um, documentations were so, um, first international, um, second uh, complex that they required one document that would be the arbitration agreement to basically encompass all the stakeholders in the this project finance, i.e., the the, uh, uh, the build the building of um, a wind farm. So you had, of course, the investors. You had sometimes the state. You had the um, uh, the, the tech uh, uh, owners, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, I, I, that is something. The drafting of such complex arbitration agreements, something that I did already. 20, more than 20 years ago. By the same um, token, um, solar pla uh, plants uh, have given rise to a lot of uh, disputes, investments, but also contractual disputes, uh, especially with uh, what, four or five years ago, um, issues we, we, you had with supply chains and with the fact that most uh, uh, solar plants were coming from from China, with you know this uh, uh, tariff war and and trade war that uh, we have experienced and which is not over. Uh, I want to say something else, also as a background. And uh, my apologies if uh, my introduction is a little bit um, 
is a little bit long. Um, climate change uh, uh, disputes uh, that are at the very heart of the energy transition um, are as um, opposed to what one would believe on the rise, but not everywhere and not that evidently. Uh, there is a report that was released not that long ago, which I, I would um, command you to read, which is called Global Trends in Climate Change Litigation 2023, which was done by the, the uh, LSE, the London School of Economics, Columbia Law School, and the Center for Climate Change Economics and, and uh, Policy. And, and it is interesting, um, I would like to share with you um, a few um, a few figures um, in uh, over one year from June 2022 to, to May 2023 um, this report has been able to gather 2341 cases um, as based on climate change and very, there are very spe specific criteria to basically say whether it is a climate change or not. And I, I will probably not get into, into that. There are uh, new uh, jurisdictions uh, involved. It's not the, just the, the usual suspects in, um, in some European uh, countries. Uh, Bulgaria, China, Finland, uh, Russia, Th Thailand and Turkey have been added to this, um, uh, to this uh, uh, mass of jurisdictions uh, concerned by this climate change uh, litigation uh, trend. Uh, it's interesting also to note that more than 50% of those climate change cases have direct judicial outcomes that can be understood as being favorable to climate action. Now, one of them, which I'm sure you have all heard of, and it's something my, my firm has been dealing with more in front of courts than uh, in front of um, arbitration pallets, panels is what um, uh, is typically called greenwashing. It is the idea, especially for some oil and gas companies, to say that they are environmental friendly um, in a misleading manner. And uh, this is why some climate change uh, um, uh, criteria have been also uh, set in a very specific manner. And again, this is a cause of, uh, uh, of disputes. Uh, I will not uh, probably cover the US, but uh, I would like to, you to, to be aware of the existence of this um, report and the increasing number of studies focusing on disputes related to climate change and in relation to energy transition. Now, the three points I wanted to tackle given this background is um, uh, is uh, um, are, are have to do with um, three aspects. One, I think I already uh, covered having to do with um, arbitration agreements. I told you about um, that's uh, the, the fact that some arbitration agreements could be quite complex to to draft in that uh, specific background. Uh, it is um, uh, also important to mention in the category of arbitration agreements, something that uh, we have heard uh, already about arbitrability. Climate change uh, involves policies and, and thus public policy. And it is sometimes quite difficult to have climate change disputes um, resolved by way of uh, of arbitration simply because at some point you the arbitrator may have to raise the question or be subject to the question of whether a specific act um, was legal and and not um, uh, compliant with for example investment uh, treaty and legality is a question of national law and and it is sometimes um, or very often difficult for an arbitrator to basically decide on the legality of a certain act. Now, I, I would like to tackle the big uh, um, topic having to do not with arbitration agreements, but with procedural challenges posed by those climate change 
uh, disputes trend. One is the fact that our industry, and I mean by industry arbitration, has been, and I think many have uh, recognized this, very energy uh, intensive. Uh, we all are aware of the fact that um, um, many, many arbitrations uh, have uh, induced a large, uh, an overwhelming number of uh, documents, hard uh, copies, uh, travels, and sometimes uh, uh, in an unnecessary uh, way. Now, with COVID, of course, came the use of uh, e-hearings, uh, e-cross-examination, and of course, webinars like the one we're having today. Um, it is also um, a sort of uh, catch-22 we are today in, because the reality is that we are realizing that using um, electronic methods are not necessarily more uh, climate-friendly than uh, doing or much more than doing what we used to do. And I'll take you, I'll give you one example, artificial intelligence. I think it is also a fact that um, using artificial intelligence uh, will generate uh, an energy consumption like the world is not capable of absorbing if everyone was to use, uh, to use artificial in intelligence, let alone arbitrators and litigants. Um, the other aspect uh, that is uh, another procedural challenge when uh, one talks about climate change uh, disputes is the fact that uh, inevitably you will have uh, an increasing number of stakeholders in the dispute. And again, I think everyone knows that it is one of the challenge of arbitration to have everyone around the table uh, in, in an arbitration when uh, it involves a large number of, um, uh, of stakeholders. The last aspect, the last procedural challenge is uh, one what, that is less being uh, covered. It's the appointment of expert arbitrators, or perhaps I would say arbitrators that are more inclined to, um, to be knowledgeable about climate change um, stakes. And here you have two aspects. Uh, one is a policy uh, consideration uh, and whether we want institutions, for example, to appoint people more likely to know about those cases than others. And of course, the question of uh, knowledge uh, raises the question of whether those uh, arbitrators uh, are likely to be biased in favor of some sort of disputes. Um, and this is a, a true question. And um, it is possible, I'm not saying this is gonna happen, but exactly like the ICC is, uh, has imposed slowly but surely uh, some requirements in, ter in terms of availability that an arbitrator before being appointed um, checks uh, some boxes um, in, in terms of uh, knowledge and perhaps sensitivity to so some, uh, some disputes. The last aspect, and I will be uh, finished with that, I promise Brahim, is uh, enforcement and annulment. Um, I think... Um, you have, um, I, I will not uh, uh, touch upon investment arbitration, although there's a lot to say about new trends in uh, BITs and, um, and, uh, and models incorporating um, environmental defenses um, in um, uh, available to states uh, and as counterclaims. What I, I wanted to finish on was about, uh, was on enforcement and annulment. Uh, and uh, this is a case I'm currently handling before a French courts uh, when, um, uh, without giving the specifics and, and names, a uh, state had, has, has privatized its uh, oil and gas company uh, with an environmental clause, which turned out to cost them much more than what was expected, leading to a dispute and then as a result to an arbitration that was 
uh, rendered in favor of the uh, company that um, was the beneficiary of the privatization. What is interesting is that unexpectedly, uh, the state has tried to challenge the award, but instead of going um, on a contractual level, uh, it has raised um, competition law issues and, and uh, uh, arguments having to do with uh, state aids, etc. That shows the sensitivity uh, and how difficult uh, the transition uh, from oil and gas energy to, um, to basically protect the environment is uh, becoming on the ground, raising stakes and, um, and, and probably fighting more than, than ever. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Dr. Aladeb, for this brilliant introduction of yours and telling us more about the artificial intelligence and its surprising energy consumption if hundreds of millions of people use it. Building on your international arbitration experience of excellence, could you please perhaps very briefly, if you have the time, share to the audience a very few important differences between commercial and investment arbitration in specific landscape of energy disputes? Well, one of them is, uh, um, is, um, is the point, Brahim, I just uh, um, I touched upon, which is uh, the fact that um, as, um, as a defense, uh, more and more um, investment treaties, the modern ones will have this, uh, um, uh, this clause as a sort of protection. And uh, more than a defense, it is interesting to see that it is uh, becoming a, a potential counterclaim. Um, uh, there is a couple of investment cases which ex exemplify this, uh, this issue. But what makes it interesting is that this trend is making it um, or making the environmental, the environmental issue closer to contractual disputes than it used to be the case before. Thank you very much, Dr. Ladeb. We feel extremely privileged, the audience included, to have learned from your decades of cross-border prime experiences today. Thank you so much for having accepted the invitation and thanks so much for having accepted to share your precious insights. Thank you, Brahim. Uh, of course, thank you so much. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce you to our third and last panelist, Sherin Futuki. Sherin Futuki was a former global international arbitration specialist at Mayor Brown London and has now launched her own initiative, Al Matura and Partners, where she works as an independent consultant in, inter in international dispute resolution and public international law practices. Thank you, Sherin, for joining us from London today. With a dual training background, she boasts an impressive career across several prestigious law firms in France and in the UK. Her mark in the arbitration sphere is especially noted for her very valuable contributions to energy, resources, and environmental disputes, where she has a strong specialization. Sherin, can you please share more on the key drivers behind the energy transitions in the MINE region and how do they align with global sustainability goals? Good afternoon, uh, everyone, or evening, uh, wherever you may be joining uh, us from. I think the diversity of our connection truly showcases um, the essence of arbitration. But before I answer the question, I want to thank you, Ibrahim, for the kind introduction and express my sincere gratitude to both you and Ita for extending this invitation. Um, it's a real honor to also be speaking alongside um, such esteemed co-practitioners co on a timely um, and critical topic. So I think we had a good insight with already uh, the previous comments of uh, Jalal and, and Jessica, but when it comes to delving into this intricate landscape um, of the MENA region and um, the resonance with global sustainable objective, I think it necessitates a comprehensive analysis, but because we are time constrained today, I will provide a quick overall picture and some of the list, some of the key factors. 
Um, it is no secret that Arab oil exporters find themselves at a critical juncture, compelled to undertake substantial um, policy reform aimed at diversifying uh, their energy and economic landscape, thereby they departing from the entrenched reliance on rent-based political uh, economy. Alongside traditional fossil fuels, they are exploring various energy transition paths, including renewable, net zero hydrocarbon, um, and also hydrogen. And this is motivated in part by the decreasing global demand for fossil fuel that possesses significant challenges, especially for wealthy GCC states. Despite initial resistance previously, these states are not truly, and I think it has been highlighted by um, the co-panelists, embracing energy transition project. And it is evident in pledges for net zero emissions, such as the Saudi vision uh, 2030, with a plane aiming um, for a 35% reduction in greenhouse gas emission and a balanced energy mix of 50% renewable resources and 50% natural gas. There is also a further pledge for uh, 2060 for net zero. So this shift is remarkable, especially considering um, the GCC state's previous reputation worldwide uh, as climate obstructionists. Um, they now position clearly themselves as clean energy leaders, leveraging their expertise in hydrocarbon and the potential advantages that green energy can bring. Um, so I think this is one on the one of the main um, the main key driver, but not only, it's important to mention that the primary drive behind this transition in the GCC also lies strongly in economic factors. The aim is to protect hydrocarbon exports while creating new revenue streams to sustain political stability, state roles, and socioeconomic development. And consequently, domestic shifts toward re renewable energy and energy efficiency sometimes take a back seat with priority given to projects promoting more exports um, like hydrogen or carbon capture. So this is for the overall picture. But if we look now a bit more closely at the key drivers, um, I think the main, the first key driver to mention is climate vulnerability. And this is the case almost everywhere. It's a global uh, situation, but it is exacerbated by MENA geography and economic reliance on local ecosystem. It is a problem that has been underscored uh, by um, the IPCC um, report on climate change because there are a lot of issues to address. Desertification, water stress, as mentioned by uh, Professor Abdel Wahab in his keynotes, extreme weather events and other challenges, um, jeopardizing the region's stability and prosperity. Then you have obviously resource, resource potential for renewable energy, which induces the need to intensify uh, renewable energy deployment. If we take the example, for instance, of North Africa, uh, despite renewable energy's potential there, as well as the historical role of hydropower in parts of the region, renewables continue to have a small share of the electricity mix to date, for instance. There is data from 2020 indicating that hydropower accounts for about 7% of North Africa's total electricity generation. Hydropower's use is concentrated, if we look at North Africa in Egypt, Sudan, and Morocco in that order. And there is some scarcity difference uh, in the allocation with um, ranges from 12% in Morocco to a big 44% in Sudan. On the contrary, you have other countries that have a slower pace, like Algeria, Libya, and Tunisia. They have small or no hydro capacity at all due to a lack of resource. Other renewables account for some 6% of the electricity mix with wind energy contribution ranging from as high as 13% in Morocco to close to nil in Algeria, Libya and Sudan. And fossil fuel based thermal electricity generation accounts for close to 94% in of the total region uh, electricity generation. So there is um, definitely resource potential deployment that is ongoing and to implement that national plans are also a key driver. Uh, it was briefly mentioned by Jessica um, and I think one of the main uh, trigger 
of intensifying national plight has been definitely Paris Agreement. A lot of countries together with 189 other member states of uh, the UNFCCC in 2016 have signed this agreement. And within this context, they are required to submit their NDCs, so nationally determined um, contribution, every five years. And they need to describe the mitigation, adaptation action that they pledge to implement uh, in order to stay in line with the agreement's objectives. So far, the positive side is that most countries have submitted their first NDC between 2016 and 2017, except some like Libya, um, who are yet to ratify the Paris Agreement. But if we look at the overall picture, this is quite positive. All the NDCs uh, include both unconditional and conditional renewable energy capacity expansions target for 2030. And even though some countries have no unconditional targets like Algeria or Egypt, um, there is a policy ambition of particularly the North African countries and also Middle East uh, that indicate their desire to achieve a larger share of renewable as in ele electricity generation. And in fact, um, one comes with the other. Um, most have actively integrated renewable energy targets into their national energy plan along with the NDCs. Um, and these targets predominantly focus on the power sector, renewable um, power targets in terms of install capacity and share of renewable in the electricity mix. Overall, in North Africa, uh, despite traditionally relying on fossil fuels, there is an increasing interest, uh, as I mentioned, particularly um, for solar and wind power. And currently, Morocco stands out with recent addition of large wine and solar projects to its energy mix. We have also other countries like Sudan who introduced the use of traditional bioengineering for household purposes. And in parallel, in the Middle East, Saudi Arabia and the UAE particularly um, have positioned themselves as a leader in clean energy, aiming for net zero emissions through initiatives like uh, the Circular Carbon Economy National Program and investment in clean uh, hydrogen projects. But of course, plans vary in ambition and targets depending uh, countries. Another key driver, and it goes with uh, national plans, is fossil fuel subsidies and power sector reforms, as well as fiscal and financial incentives. Um, like, like most of you know, the countries looking to a transition for, uh, to, to cleaner energy, governments in MENA commonly employ fiscal policies to support renewable energy. And there is widespread, it is widespread among such policies that you have tax incentive like value added uh, tax, custom import tax exemption, capital uh, depreciation, capital allowances. Uh, if we take one example, Egypt, they have updated, Egypt has a bit updated its investment law in 2017 and provided investment incentive for renewable energy based project, including a 30% deduction of net taxable profit for the first seven years of a project lifetime and reduced custom duties for from five to 2% on equipment and machinery. And this project may also be eligible for an exemption on land tax. So there is a factor that is to be attracting more foreign investment as well, but definitely it is to foster cleaner energy sources project. And last but not least, uh, structure procurement project and other policies for renewable power. Um, it is it is also a key factor, such as feed-in tariff and competitive auctions. It forms part of some uh, North African countries' evolving policy basket for the power sector. And I think it is fair to say that both the GCC and North African country have the similar challenges uh, when it comes to transitioning to cleaner energy sources. And recently, we've seen a lot of initiatives, project commitment that signals this shift toward the, a more sustainable future. Uh, we we mentioned already in this webinar, I think, the NEOM project that aimed to pr produce 1.2 million tons of green hydrogen-based ammonia per year. And Saudi Aramco, uh, as mentioned by Professor Abdel Wahab in the keynote, has planned to capture the lion's share of blue hydrogen demand by 2025 with successful 
export already of blue ammonia uh, to Japan in 2020 and to South Korea in 2022. Um, very briefly, I think it is also worth to mention that uh, policies influence the direct use of renewables, heating, cooling, and transport, and um, it is also a key factor. So um, countries, I think, and particularly in North Africa, lacks comprehensive policies supporting these investments, but there is progress. And yet the region is implementing more and more initiatives, pilot schemes, scalable programs that could be expanded in coming years, given greater political interest. I would say that overall, if we want to look at the current status and the challenges, in the GCC state, the energy landscape is predominantly reliant on hydrocarbons for both domestic consumptions and exports. And these hydrocarbons constitute over 95% of energy consumption, with re export revenue serving as a significant portion of GDP. And the fact that uh, in recent years, we have witnessing, witnessed sorry, promising development. It, it, it indicates definitely a potential improvement in the near future, suggesting a promising outlook for progress. And to give a bit of perspective, I will give quickly two examples. Uh, for instance, the UAA has made notable strides by achieving a remarkable 7% share of renewable energy and total electricity capacity by 2020, surpassing the initial target set by Bahrain, Kuwait and Qatar combined. So this is a great example that even though even though generally the, the target for renewable right now remains below 1% in most states, there is good progress uh, going on. Similarly, Oman and Saudi Arabia have modest percentage of renewable energy in total electricity capacity, 0.40% and 0.20% respectively, with differing national targets. But Oman uh, aims for 10% by 2025, while Saudi Arabia adopts a multi-tiered approach targeting 30% of electricity generation for renewable nuclear and other sources by various deadlines. Thank you, Sherry, for a very clear intervention, <clears throat> showcasing more initiatives from North Africa as well, which is slowly entering the arena. I am personally expecting a lot from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the Algeria modernization of its industry as the largest country of Africa. Discussing sustainability, one very close aspect that easily comes to mind for practitioners is also the human rights aspect that often touches sustainability. We would then be very happy to learn from your human rights and environmental expertise in an international arbitration context. In particular, what challenges do arbitral tribunals face when had addressing human rights and environmental issues within the ISDS framework? And why are they generally reluctant to open the door to these matters? Um, I think there is first an important fact to, to mention is um, these dispute type of disputes are intricately um, connected with social corporate social responsibility as well. And when you deal with a dispute um, in MENA, you have to, de to deal with um, issues that are deeply influenced by sometimes Islamic values, uh, Sharia law, and it often intersect with CSR practices. You have concepts such as philanthropy, zakat, social responsibility, ihzan, ethical business conduct, adil, that play a significant role in shaping these initiatives. And I think that Jalal mentioned green greenwashing uh, when it comes to to discussing these issues, you need to you need to be aware of the full spectrum of issue that you might can encounter and to adapt depending on the region. Now, when it comes to arbitral tribunal of addressing human rights and environmental issues, um, I think um, this is not a situation that is only um, impacting MENA. It's a global situation. Investment agreement with ISDS mechanisms are designed to attract foreign investment. And recently, um, they have been criticized for hindering government's ability to implement climate and development policies. For instance, the 
ECT, has been used by fossil fuels firm to challenge state measures impacting climate action. And the lack of transparency and certainty uh, in ISDS processes may sometimes pose, pose, pose um, sorry, challenges for states aiming to enact um, those policies. There is a real concern for um, over ISDS chilling effect on legislation, and it has prompted calls for reform, termination of treaties, particularly amid rising ISDS uh, recent claims um, in Europe. So that's the comprehensive uh, framework, the global picture. And with that in mind, when arbitral tribunal encounters several challenges uh, linked to this framework, it can range from jurisdictional constraints, so determining the tribunal's jurisdiction to hear a claim related to human rights and environmental issues can be really intricate. The language in the treaty varies with some provision offering broader jurisdiction than other, and tribunals must interpret this provision to ascertain the extent of their jurisdiction, so it can be a bit tricky. Um, Another challenge is the ambiguity in applicable law. Tribunals may have discretion to determine the applicable law in investment arbitration cases. However, uncertainty exists regarding whether human rights and environmental norms falls within the scope of international law as referred in the investment treaty. And sometimes a lack of clarity can complicate the application of legal standards. And even more when you're dealing with a dispute that is um, Sharia law related or when you don't have the expertise, the tribunal doesn't have the tailored expertise to deal with it. A third factor is the complexity of legal framework. Human rights and environmental law are, it, are intricate and multifaceted. There are regional jurisdictional differences, as mentioned by Jessica, not to mention the, the, nuance, the nuance already um, I already mentioned of Sharia law. More generally, the tribunal um, need the tailored expertise um, on climate change uh, to be able to assess the merit of the claim and counterclaims related to these issues. Because this is very, um, I mean, the knowledge needed is is quite um, the level is quite high. A fourth factor is the political sensitivity the arbitrability and legality of an act, as mentioned by Jalel. Uh, it often involves uh, public policies. Human rights and environmental disputes um, are sensitive matters and tribunal may hes hesitate to adjudicate on these issues when it could provoke sometimes diplomatic tensions or public scrutiny, especially in the absence of clear guidance from the uh, treaty or international law. And uh, bearing in mind that often these claims involve local population and may involve ind indigenous uh, communities, right? It has been well seen in LATAM disputes, for instance, and um, it may also be seen in, in MENA disputes. Another factor is the risk, risk of expanding tri tribunal's mandate. So addressing human rights and environmental issues may require the tribunal to interpret and apply the norm beyond traditional investment protection standards or environmental clause. Tribunal may be cautious, maybe too, mo maybe too much, to expanding their role beyond resolving disputes solely related to investment-specific matters and more traditional um, disputes that do not require climate change uh, expertise. And finally, the impact on investors' confidence. Introducing human rights and environmental issues into ISDS uh, may raise concern among uh, investors about the predictability, the stability of arbitration and uh, of the investment environment. Um, so I think this, this gives you a good perspective. And if um, I'm just conscious about the, the timing, but um, if anyone wants to explore uh, this further, I would highly recommend to have a look at the El Warak case v Indonesia. It is a very interesting case that put this into perspective. Um, a lot of scholars and activists debate uh, human rights issues have tended to have a relatively marginal place in investor state arbitration. But interestingly, in this uh, case, um, this case represents a departure from this trend. So, that's that's my answer to your question. Thank you very much, Erin. Your, your intervention was excellent. Thanks so much. It also marks the end of this panel of excellency. 
Congratulations again for your new initiative, Almatura and Partners in London, which is the new Many and promising player in the market. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for uh, addressing the new case law of Indonesia, which may uh, change the cards. As we have indeed reached the end of our journey through the energy transition uh, in the Middle East, I would like to thank again the audience and to extend my gratitude to all of our panelists. I hope that you will all agree with me that the insights shared today do pave the way for better approaches for the MENA region, whether as a council or an arbitrator. Having an excellent grasp on foreign investment opportunities and challenges in the MENA, particularly in this energy transition market, market and context, is very important to have in mind. Thank you for joining us at Energy Transitions in MENA, supported and hosted by the Young ITA. We look forward to continuing these important conversations in the future and, of course, to meeting you in person in a few days, inshallah, for the Riyadh Disputes Week. Thank you once again and take care. Shukran kathir ala hadharatkum. Arakum ala qareem, inshallah, wa salam alaikum. Ma Merci. Merci, many thanks to you all. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you to me also. Bye.